Hi, my name is Mark Riggins, and I'm pastor here at LifePoint, located in Plano, Texas, and we meet here every Sunday at 1030, and we are here for your family. I hope today's message is an encouragement to you. Good morning. As Isaac said, we're in the middle of our series that we're calling Crave, and what we're talking about is this idea of grace, and what we're discovering is it's what we deserve the least, but what we crave the most. But what is it? What really is grace? Because we use the word all the time. Like, if you're a musician, you know about grace notes, or we want to get in someone's, we want to behave well enough to get in someone's good graces. Or or sometimes we'll say, hey, that person is so attractive, they're graced with good looks. Or maybe you're one of those people who you like to say grace before a meal. We're always using this word as if we know what it means. But what does it mean? And the Bible all throughout scripture talks about grace in terms of story more than doctrine. So each week we're looking at a different story to better understand grace. What exactly is grace? So we have an anchoring verse that we're using to help us really own it. And by the end of the series, if you come regularly, I would invite you to consider even memorizing it to better understand grace. And these are the verses for our series. It's Romans chapter 3, Verses 23 and 24, and it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Romans 3, 23 and 24. Now, would you just say that verse out loud with me, or those two verses out loud with me? Say it with me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Romans 3, 23, and 24. Well, this over the last couple of weeks, really we've been taking these polls and what we've been finding is there's an affinity. We have a lot in common with each other and we have a lot that we don't share in common with each other. If you've been taking some of those polls with us on social media, we've talked about how many of you crave peanut M&Ms versus plain M&Ms, right? Salty snacks versus sweet snacks. Or we've talked about Whataburger versus In-N-Out, and that gave a little energy, right? Or we've talked about sweet tea versus unsweet tea. We, we, we keep taking, here's what's interesting. I think as we've gone through this, it's, it's fun, but what's interesting to me is when you like something I like, I feel a connection with you. I feel like a, an affinity. When you dislike something I dislike, I feel an affinity with you. It's a way of connecting and there isn't anything necessarily wrong with it. It's one of the reasons that we join groups. Like we'll join a Facebook group or we'll follow a specific Instagram account of somebody that we have an affinity with, uh, with other people who follow the same account. It's why we we, we have shared interests we find affinity, right? If you like video gaming or if you like paddle boarding, like we'll have the shared interests and all of a sudden we just have a connection with people or shared concerns, right? Maybe politically you have a party that you really affiliate with and with other people who share that same concern you just feel an affinity toward that or a political issue a specific issue that you really care about maybe in the community and what happens is when we have that affinity with other people it's a beautiful thing it can create a connection with other people and it's wonderful however an affinity can become dangerous when I use it to determine who I'm for and who I'm against when the affinity becomes an opportunity to divide, then it's no longer helpful and it actually becomes dangerous. And we tend to choose sides when that happens. And, and we've all experienced this over the last two or three years. It's one of the things we have in common is as we look around our nation over the last couple of years, we've seen an increasing divide because people, instead of recognizing that we have differences, We are using those differences to divide us, right? We're using those affinity to say, oh, then I'm for you, but I'm against you because of our differences. We saw this with the 2020 presidential election, didn't we? Like there was Trump versus Biden. We saw all the yard signs. We saw all the social media debates, all the heated conversations. Like we were in this world where you were either for us or against us. 
And then in the social media uh, pandemic, rather the, the pandemic that we just came through with masks, we saw that again where there was this, this big divide where there were some people who were saying, I'm not wearing a mask and I'm going to judge anybody who does. And on the other side, we had people who were the mask police and they were saying, nope, this is the way it's supposed to be. And there was this, this division, wasn't it? Over, we may have had differences, but we allowed those differences to divide us. And the question is, why do differences, why does it require that a difference would divide us. Well, the truth is, it's exhausting, isn't it? After a while where the latest issue comes up and all of a sudden we feel like we're supposed to be on team A or team B and we're supposed to know enough to have an opinion and that means we're for them and we're against them. It can just be really exhausting, can it? When these affinities or these differences require division. So let me ask you a real personal question. Are you allowing an affinity to determine who you are for and who you are against? In other words, are you allowing differences to result in division? Now, when kids are young, we see this all the time, right? In elementary school, we see kids who just sort of say, no, you're not like me because you're different, because you're not, like, we don't share the same likes or dislikes. And so kids kind of have this simple mentality. And, and kids, when they're in elementary school, will do something like this. They'll say, I'll be for you if, you just got to do this, you got to dress like me, behave like me, look like me, talk like me, be for the things I'm for and dislike the things I don't like. That's all you got to do, and then we will be friends. And we would say, well, that's a kid. That's what a kid would do. But when we become adults, surely we become more mature, right? Surely we don't act like this anymore. Surely we have more bandwidth to recognize differences don't require division. But the truth is we live in a nation that's increasingly divided, and we as adults are allowing affinity to divide us. And so we think that we're a little more mature, and so we do it this way. As adults, we say, well, I'll be for you if you vote the way I vote. I'll be for you if you see whatever issue I really care about the way I see that issue. Then I can be for you. Otherwise, those differences will require division. And all of a sudden, we're back to the elementary school mentality of differences requiring division. Well, surely, as Jesus followers, people who attend church, who are trying to be like Christ, surely we are different. Surely we aren't in that place of differences requiring division. And if you're new here, you already know better. You know the answer to that question. You may have been hesitant to attend here today because you hear that the church, what they're against, way more than you hear what the church is for. And if you're here today and you're a Christ follower and you're trying to figure out, hey, I want to be more like Jesus, you already know if you grew up in church, we have a tendency to know who the real Christians are and who the non-Christians are. We can just tell the way you talk, the places you go, the things that you do. And after a while, we've just sort of Honestly, gravitational pull moves us toward this us versus them mentality. And there's this division based on differences. And here's how we do it as Christians. And this is obviously an indictment. This question is, how do we as Christians determine who we are for and who we are against? Is it based on how much Bible knowledge someone knows? Is it based on how much uh, church attendance they have? Is anything, no? We, we, we go a little further than that. We say, I'll be for you as a Christian if you sin like I sin. If you sin like I sin, we're good. And this is where we've gotten off track is we are experts at judging people who sin differently than us. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about sinners and Christians. No, we're all in that boat, right? We are all people who sin. We're all people who have brokenness, who have this propensity towards sin. It never ends on this side of heaven. That's why 1 John 1, 8 reminds us that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so we just judge people who sin differently than us. And here's the thing, this isn't like a 21st century problem. Even though the last couple of years it's magnified in our country in ways maybe it hasn't been in our lifetime, this has actually been around a really long time. In fact, we're going to go back today to the very first century and we're going to see two really famous Jesus followers, Peter and Paul, and they're going to have a face-to-face -face argument 
over this very thing. And that's going to be our story of grace today. And you might think, that doesn't sound like a story of grace. Well, we're going to see the impact of when grace leaves a conversation that it has and then what it looks like when grace re-enters the conversation. And I can't help but think in this day and age, that may be the most relevant thing we can talk about because maybe that's one of the things as a nation we're facing is grace has left the conversation. And we're going to be shown a way to allow grace to re-enter the conversation. So I hope you're going to look with me at this heated conversation. It's found in Galatians chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible, there's one there in the pew, and you can actually grab it, and you can pick it up and turn with me to page number 943. And we're going to see one person call out another person. These are two famous Jesus followers. Now, before we look at the passage, though, I just want to make sure you know this one thing. Peter, in this moment of this heated argument, he's the prominent one. He's the known Christian. Paul, not so much. Peter, and the reason that matters is in the preceding verses that we're not going to read today, Peter publicly endorsed Paul for Paul's unique ministry to the non-Jewish Gentile people. Big deal for Paul. So exciting. And everybody's excited because this is a beautiful endorsement from Peter to Paul. And at this moment, it's like, it's like celebration emojis and heart emojis and everybody's good. Peter endorsed Paul. And then Paul immediately opposes Peter. What has Paul so upset that he would not only oppose him, he would oppose him publicly and then he would record it for us to see? Why is this such a big deal between two prominent followers of Jesus that they would have this argument, it would be recorded for you and I to benefit from? I think this is a timely time to look at this passage. So I hope you'll look at it with me in Galatians chapter 2. And let's begin in verse 11. Just those first three words, kind of, or first few words, give us a great context there. It says, when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch. He said, now what, what, what's the deal with Antioch again? Now remember, Antioch is Peter's home church, okay? This is his home turf. He's 300 miles north of Jerusalem. So Peter, this prominent, well-known, famous Christian, has traveled for a few weeks to get to Paul's home turf, Antioch. Can you imagine how excited Paul is to have Peter, the one who endorsed him, come to his home church? This is a big moment in Paul's life. It's like meeting your hero, whoever your hero is. Can you imagine welcoming them into your home? This is that moment for Paul. And as Paul retells the story, look how Paul receives Peter into his home church. He says, and I opposed him to his face. Welcome, hero, to my home church. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. What's got Paul so upset that he would take Peter, who's so prominent follower of Jesus, and that he would oppose him to his face and then almost brag about it and record it in Scripture for us to read 2,000 years? Like, what is going on? What has really got Paul upset? You see, it's important that we understand these two figures in history in this moment. Peter is sort of the spokesman for the apostles. That's how prominent he is. He's one of the leaders in the early church. He's one, some would say at that moment, he was the most prominent Christian on the planet. Meanwhile, Paul, nobody knows who Paul is. Paul's an unknown figure at this moment. He hasn't even taken one of his missionary journeys yet. He's going to become somebody, but at this moment, he is not known. And he's like David against Goliath, and yet he's opposing him to his face. What in the world has Paul so upset? And it's this. Peter was changing his eating habits. And you might think, what? Like, is he on the Atkins diet, the South Beach diet? Like, why is Paul so upset about Peter changing his eating habits? What is it that has Paul so upset? Well, that's where we're going to pick up the story today because what happens next is so important. Paul goes on to tell the story in verse 12. Look what he says. This is why I'm upset, Paul says. For certain men, before certain men came from James, who's another church leader, 
Peter used to eat with the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. But when they arrived, these certain men, these Christian Jews with James, Peter began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles. Oh, so it still doesn't quite make sense, but what Paul is getting at is, I see hypocrisy in Peter. He used to eat with the Gentiles, but now that some of his Christian Jewish friends have come up from Jerusalem, all of a sudden he withdraws and he doesn't eat. Now why would that bother Paul? Remember, Paul's the one that's trying to share Jesus with these Gentiles. And the most prominent Christian on the planet is saying, no, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna eat with those Gentiles. It's hard for us to fathom how big of a deal this was, the tension that was existing in the first century when it came to eating. Because for the Jewish person, because of their religious laws, they had certain foods that were unclean. And if you ate the food, you were unclean. And if you were unclean, they would go at all costs to avoid you. And so these Christian Jews have come up and they see Gentiles and they immediately think and say, unclean, unclean. And Peter's going, oh yeah, that's right, that's the way we think. And he just all of a sudden, even though God has already given him a vision revealing that the foods are no longer unclean, and yet in this moment, something happens and Peter pulls away. What is going on with Peter is what I'm wondering. Why would he suddenly eat with the Gentiles and then not eat with the Gentiles? Well, here's why. The rest of that verse, verse 12 says, because he was afraid. He was afraid. Oh, who's he afraid of? Well, it goes on to say, he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. It's funny, they're just called the circumcision group. They're not even called the, Jew, you know, the Jewish group. They're just the circumcision group. Why are they called that? Because remember, these are the, Jew, the Jewish people who believed that Jesus coming to earth, we're just simply adding that on to what we already believe. In other words, in order to become a Christian, you've got to become Jewish. In order to become Christian, it requires surgery. And Paul is kind of pointing out how absurd that is. He just calls them the circumcision group. You kind of feel the condescension in his voice when he says it. And he's pointing out that, Peter, you're afraid of these people. And what's happened is these people have shown up in Antioch and there's Gentiles all around who Paul is trying to share Jesus with. And they, these Christian Jews show up and they tell Peter, Peter, you got to choose sides. There's a difference between us and them. And in order to be for us, you have to be against them. And Peter feels the peer pressure of that moment and he withdraws from his mission. He's just endorsed Paul to go and share Jesus with these people, but now he's withdrawing from the very people. Why? Because he's afraid. Scripture says he's afraid. Now let's be honest. What pushes us in this day in 2020, 2021, and 2022 more than anything else when you watch cable news, more than anything else when you see a social media ad, it's fear. It's always the same thing. We're afraid of if we go this direction, here's what's going to happen. It's always fear, isn't it? And it's motivating Paul, uh, Peter as well. Fear is what provokes us to choose a side and then oppose the people who are on the other side. I can't just have a position and vote. I have to oppose the people on the other side. Fear moves us to that place. And Peter begins to choose sides in this moment because of fear. And you know what's so sad is Peter's the one, remember he's the one that denied Jesus publicly three times. He's also the one who later Jesus came to on the Sea of Galilee, the shore, and he said, do you love me three times? Yes, yes, yes. Well then feed my sheep. Like he's the one, he's all in. We see early in the book of Acts, he's the one that's leading the way. He's the most bold of them all. And now all of a sudden we get to Antioch and he's like, no, I don't know. I, I'm going to retreat if it's going to include going all the way to the Gentiles. Fear. And here's what's fascinating about Peter, if you were asked Peter, Peter, what's your main thing? What's your primary identity? He would have said, following Jesus. However, Peter claimed following Jesus was his primary identity, but people who knew him best in this moment in Antioch would say that being Jewish was his primary identity because he withdrew from the people who weren't Jewish. 
So let me ask you, if you're a Jesus follower here today, let me get you to do a quick little exercise. Insert your name in this first blank. You claim that following Jesus is your primary identity. The people who know you best in this season of your life, what would they say is your primary identity? Based on your fears, based on what your passions are and what you talk about the most, what would those who know you best say is your primary identity? For Peter, it was being Jewish. And I know that wasn't the legacy he wanted in that moment. Fear caused Peter to be hypocritical. In a moment where God had been using him over and over again, all of a sudden, he did what he never wanted to do. And then it gets worse. And it always does because we always have influence we don't fully know about. Look what happens in verse 13. It goes on to say, And the other Jews joined him... In his hypocrisy, now this is Paul, of course, writing this passage, and Paul's pulling no punches. He's a hypocrite, and others are following him in his hypocrisy. And then he goes on to say, not only were others following him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, the people who followed the hypocrite, Paul is saying, even Barnabas was led astray. Big deal, because Paul was eventually probably mentoring Barnabas and was eventually going to partner with Barnabas to go on his missionary journeys. He's seeing the cost of this. The question I keep having, though, is why does Paul care so much about this? Why can't he just say, well, Peter disappointed me. I'm going to move on. Why does he confront Peter publicly with this? And why does he then record it in Scripture for you and I to read 2000? What's really going on here? Why is this such a big deal that differences sometimes equal division? And no, we don't like it. It's just the reality of human beings. Why is this really that big of a deal? Well, this is where Paul turns it up a little bit. Look at verse 14. Paul responds, I've seen enough division, he said, that when I saw that they, the Christian Jews, were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, in front of them all, that's how big of a deal this is, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. Now he goes on to say, how is it then? that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. I want you to see in this verse, first of all, it says, in line with the truth of the gospel. He's telling Peter, this is our plumb line. This determines right and wrong. Not the latest cultural hot takes. Isn't this a great reminder for us? Whatever the latest headline is in the news that'll come up this week is not our truth. Our truth is the gospel. And we keep coming back and centering ourselves here. Paul is making it clear to Peter. He's choosing to listen to the peer pressure of these Christian Jews. But still, why does it bother Paul so much? What's going on here that Paul's so upset with Peter? And here, I love what Timothy Keller, who's pastor and author, says. At play here is probably some racism and national pride that Peter is sort of unintentionally revealing. In other words, you see it right here in this verse. It says, how is it that you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew? You're asking them to do things you're not even doing, Peter. But Peter, you don't even realize that you have been raised there in Israel, and now you're outside of Israel. You have been raised in the Jewish culture And now you're around Gentiles. And without even realizing it, it's been instilled in your heart since you were a child that those Gentiles are unclean. And it's bubbling back up again when you get around your people and you all are all together again. And you withdraw because you still see them as unclean. You still have a division over your differences. And Paul is just being very direct here. And then Paul says, I am trying to share Jesus with these Gentiles, yet you're opposing them. And he's, it's almost as if Paul is saying, hey, Peter, I'm just curious. How do you oppose someone and then share Jesus with them? Because I know I'm to share Jesus with them, and you're withdrawing from them. You're hurting the mission that Jesus has given me. 
And so he calls him out publicly. He wants the other Gentiles to be aware of what he's doing. He's not pulling any punches in front of both the Gentiles and the Jews. And isn't that a great question to ask ourselves? How can I oppose someone and share Jesus with them? So if you're new, maybe you're trying out church again and you're not sure this is a road you even want to go down. You may have understood that the church sometimes, churches have a reputation of boycotting and protesting and we're against like all kinds of stuff. We're against brands and companies and Disneyland, right? I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you are giving us grace. The truth is, as Christ followers, we make Peter's mistake time and time again. We don't want to, and that's why I believe Paul records this story. Because we have been called to share Jesus, but we can't wage war on people and share Jesus with them at the same time. And I want to take it a little step further, because I think we all have issues that we really care about, but we would also recognize, if push came to shove, that those are secondary issues when it comes to sharing Jesus. But isn't the temptation to raise the flag of a secondary issue and wave it over the kingdom of God. To take this flag of a secondary issue and each time we do, Paul is about to reveal that each time we raise that flag, grace gets dropped, it gets lowered, it gets diminished as we wave that flag over the mission of God. So Paul keeps on, there's something else bothering him and he's about to reveal it. He goes on to say, we who are Jews, in verse 15, he says, we who are Jews by birth and not those sinful Gentiles as you see them, Peter, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. We know that inherently. We've learned that because of the life of Jesus. But by faith in Jesus Christ, so that we so, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because the works of the law, no one will be justified. This is the first time Paul has used the word justified in the book of Galatians and he'll use it many times throughout. Justified is really a theme of Galatians where he's essentially saying, you're not guilty because of Jesus. Not because you're eating the right foods. Not because you're Jewish. Not because you behave well. You are not guilty because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. And in that moment, he begins to look at Peter and say, Peter, you're trying to fill a void that only grace can fill. But what you desire most is grace. But you can't earn it. And your friends that are here with you, they can never earn it either. That longing that you have, it's grace. You can't earn it. What the Gentiles want most is grace. They can't earn it. The difference is they realize they can't earn it. We're pretending like we can through eating the right foods and judging those who don't. See, without a clear eye on grace, we substitute, we try to substitute what only grace can give us. In fact, I would say it this way. Without grace, our hearts tend to manufacture self-esteem by comparing our group with their group. It's one of the ways that we choose sides. We're, we're kind of hoping we will win. We kind of hope that we'll come out on top and we'll make a point, right? It's in all of us. Maybe we'll feel better about the brokenness in this world. And we're desperately trying to manufacture grace. I just want to say, for everybody here today, what I believe Scripture teaches that you want the most is not to win, but to receive grace. And you can't earn it, and I can't earn it. It was freely given, and it just seems too good to be true. So we stand over here on the side trying to eat the right things, not eat the right things, try to obey the laws, try to do good enough things, try to accomplish enough. Meanwhile, there's grace. That's what we ultimately desire, and none of these things ever satisfy or ever last. And Paul and Peter are having it out over this very thing in this moment. And I want to tell you what you already know. No political candidate will ever offer grace. No governmental system 
will ever offer grace. And even if the legislation that you care the most about finally gets passed, it will not offer one drop of grace. Grace comes from Christ alone. And it's what we desire the most. And if we're like Peter, and I think we are, we try to achieve it on our own. I just want to say, everyone in this room has infinite value for one simple reason. Jesus Christ, with his grace, chased you all the way to the cross at Calvary. And you have infinite worth, you have infinite value because of who made you and because of who bought you. So we can stop trying to manufacture self-esteem through joining a group and then opposing another group. Instead, we can recognize, oh, we are all recipients of grace. But why does this bother Paul so much? Well, he pushes it a little further. Look at verse 19. He goes on to say, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Now think about these two guys, Peter and Paul, both raised in the same system with over 600 laws, can you imagine? Trying to earn acceptance. Paul finally realized this is an impossible journey and a test he'll never pass. So he says, I have died to the law. I am no longer going to find acceptance through that, nor will anyone else. Instead, he's saying, Jesus went to the cross to fulfill the law, and therefore, I am living my life from acceptance instead of for acceptance because of what Christ did on the cross. I can be free to live for God. So if you want to really feel good about yourself today, you don't have to pull out your resume. You don't have to you know, show us what you own. You don't have to talk about what you've accomplished. If you really want to feel good about yourself in a lasting, sustainable way, here is how you can feel good about yourself. Just remember, You can feel good about yourself today because of what Jesus has done for you. All that brokenness that you have, you know, you have a front row seat to your own brokenness, right? You see it all the time. We try to hide it. We came to church today trying to dress up as best we could. We want to look as good as we can. We want to behave as well. And that's that's great. We can connect this way. But the truth is we're all broken people. But we can feel good about ourselves because of what Jesus, knowing how broken we are, left heaven and came to earth for you And me. And then Paul says it in the end. He says, this famous verse, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I then, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul knows he's loved. Now think about this. This is a man who used to oppose Christians and Christianity in the most extreme way, and yet he's the one saying, I am fully loved by God, and Peter's trying to earn his way by eating the right things, but I'm done with that. He says, I'm now free to live because I have died to the law, and I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He had sinned enough to quit depending on himself. And he recognizes that when you surrender yourself to Jesus, God sees you as if you lived the life Jesus lived through the lens of Jesus and his grace. And now we get to the final verse. And now we find out why Paul is so upset with Peter. And now we find out why he's so publicly opposing him face to face. Because Paul has a final warning in verse 21. And here it is. Look what he says. I do not set aside the grace of God. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness, if eating well, if obeying the 600 laws could have been gained through the law, well, then Christ would have died for nothing. Peter, when you pull yourself away from the Gentiles and depend on eating the right things, you are setting aside the grace of God. Another way we could say it in our day is choosing sides 
sets aside the grace of God. When we have differences, it's one thing. Differences are inevitable. Opposition is a choice. And when I get to the place of opposition, Paul is saying we are setting aside the grace of God. We are lowering the flag of grace and we're raising whatever secondary issue we really care about. And we set aside the grace. And that's why Paul was so passionate here. Because he saw one of his very own, Peter, setting aside God's grace. It's sort of like Ryan said earlier. God in his heart, when he saw in Genesis 3 that there was a division between man and God, do you know how much he cared about that? He couldn't stand that opposition. So he spent all the Old Testament sending us a Messiah in Jesus who came and went to the cross to die for you and I. And in the moment of his death, the veil was torn as if to say there's no longer opposition, there's no longer division, there's unity again because of the cross of Calvary. And Paul is telling Peter, when you oppose people, it's like you're trying to put the veil back together. It's as if you're trying to create the opposition again. And God really cares about that. He really cares when there's somebody who doesn't know Jesus and we're pointing our finger because they sin differently than we do. Because he sent his son Jesus to earth to tear the veil and go to the cross so that we could have unity, so that we could share Jesus with more people. But how can we share Jesus with people that we're opposing? Paul is on fire because he sees the Gentile people that God has called him to reach and his own idol comes to Antioch and he begins to separate people. He begins to oppose people and he begins to divide a wall that keeps one people on one side while they oppose the people on the other and finally Paul has had enough and he says when you do that, you set aside the grace of God for these Gentile people who don't deserve it but need it more than anything. By the way, Peter, you could use a fresh dose of grace too. It's an argument that I think reveals what we all still battle with, if we're honest. It's in all of us, including me for sure. But the truth is, just like we see in Peter, every time I'm against someone, I have forgotten how much God is for them and how much he paid for them. The sad thing is, fear provokes us, and it will continue to provoke us to choose a side and oppose the people on the other side. But grace sends me back to the cross where Christ died for people on both sides. Grace it's greater than my sin. And that's a lot of grace. Grace is greater than your sin. And grace is greater than the person that you think of when you think of sinner. Grace is greater. So if you're here and you're new today, I just want to tell you, God deeply loves you. That's why he sent his son Jesus to the cross for you. And it is the greatest gift of all when we see this grace displayed there on Calvary so that you can have a full relationship with God. God loves you that much. He chased you all the way to the cross. And we saw last week that grace is not reserved for good people. It reveals God's goodness. But it all begins with the question of God just saying, will you trust me? And if that's you and you haven't trusted him yet or you haven't trusted him in a while, can I just invite you today to consider this grace again? We're gonna have people in the back that would love to pray for you. We'll be out in the lobby as staff afterwards. We would love to pray with you. Love getting to pray with, with you each week. We wanna be here for you and take this journey with you. We need grace. If you're a Christian, you know that our culture is increasingly divided. Let me close with these two questions. Are you personally choosing sides or are you choosing grace? Is there a person or a group of people that you are tempted to be against? Leading with grace is the way of Paul. More importantly, it's the way of Jesus. And I believe it's the way of life point. And may we continue to lean 
into his grace. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you couldn't stand being away from us. And so you gave the ultimate price in sending your son Jesus to pay a price we could never pay to be united with you for all of eternity. And in tearing the veil, we have full access. We can come before you with boldness in prayer today. And we don't want to fail to give that same grace to others. So God, would you move in us if there is a group of people or a person that we're hesitant to offer grace. God, would you take us back to the cross where we once again see we have received what we could never earn but what we crave the most, your grace. Let's just rest in that place this week, God. Move us each time we have a decision to make when there is a difference to not create a division, but to run to the cross. And I pray all these things in the grace of your son, Jesus. Amen. I hope today's message was an encouragement to you. And if you'd like a little more information about our church, just visit us on our website at lifepointplano.org.